All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to talk about blood pressure, but specifically, we're going to spend some time talking about the compensation mechanisms that are occurring within our body whenever we are exhibiting low blood pressure. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to specifically, again, focus on what are the compensation mechanisms that are occurring within the body, hormonal, neural, chemical, various different causes, and how that, again, how our body can compensate for that to bring our blood pressure back up. Okay, so what, what would actually trigger this to happen? Okay, we said low blood pressure, but let's get a little bit more specific, okay? What do we actually consider to be low blood pressure? Or another term that you might have heard is called hypotension. Hypotension is low blood pressure. And specifically, we categorize it whenever your systolic blood pressure Okay, the actual ventricular pressure, the amount that your ventricles are trying to expel, specifically the left, out of the heart and into the great vessels, whenever it is less than 100 millimeters of mercury. So whenever your systolic blood pressure is less than 100 millimeters of mercury, we classify that as hypotension. Now, generally what will happen is, is you're gonna have certain compensation mechanisms that are gonna occur. So we're gonna talk about it in general. We're gonna say, what are the things that are happening whenever our blood pressure drops below 100 millimeters of mercury and maybe even significantly lower, maybe down to like 80 millimeters of mercury, okay? In certain situations where it can get really low, like in hypovolemic shock. So let's talk about all these different mechanisms. Okay, well first off, how does our body detect this changes in blood pressure? through baroreceptors, pressure receptors. Where can you find those little suckers? You're gonna find them right over here. We've talked about these guys throughout a series of our videos, right? And we know that we're gonna have these special types of baroreceptors or pressure receptors located in two areas, okay? One is actually gonna be right here in what's called the aortic sinus. So you're gonna find a bunch of these little purple guys here. These are all baroreceptors and they have these sensory afferent nerve endings here. And these sensory afferent nerve endings are, again, they're gonna be located within, in this area, the aortic sinus. So again, what were these guys here called? They're called baroreceptors, and they're located in aortic sinus. Okay, now these baroreceptors are very specific and the reason why is these baroreceptors that are actually taking this information and detecting the changes in the blood pressure, this one located within the aortic sinus is carried on a specific cranial nerve and that cranial nerve is cranial nerve 10, which is also called the vagus nerve. So this is afferent fibers, general visceral afferent fibers of the vagus nerve. And they're gonna detect changes in the blood pressure within the aorta. There's other ones, and they're located right here at this bifurcation point. You see this right here? This is actually right here. This vessel moving in this area, this one right here, is called the left common carotid artery. So this one here is called the left common carotid. Right? That's what this bad boy right here is called. What happens is he comes into this area, this little kind of like bifurcation point, and splits into an external and into a internal carotid artery, right? Right at that bifurcation point, you're gonna notice there is actually gonna be some baroreceptors located within what's called the carotid sinus. So what is these ones right here called? These right here are your baroreceptors in carotid sinus. Okay, sweet deal. These guys are gonna be picking up the changes in blood pressure. Let me explain how, but first off, before I do that, what is this guy? These sensory afferent nerve endings that are actually with, uh, connected as the baroreceptors on the carotid sinus, this sensory afferent information is carried on cranial nerve nine, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, so the aortic sinus has baroreceptors which are carried on the sensory afferent fibers of vagus, the baroreceptors in the carotid sinus are gonna be carried on the sensory afferent fibers of the glossopharyngeal nerve, or cranial nerve nine. And they'll take this information into a special nucleus in the medulla that we'll talk about called the nucleus of tractus ulterius. Okay, now, quick question is, how do these baroreceptors respond to changing blood pressure? Let me say, uh, uh, kind of zoom in on that sensory nerve ending real quick. So I'm gonna zoom in real quickly on like a little sensory nerve ending. So let's say that this is the axon, right? or in this case, this part here is the peripheral process. This is the sensory nerve ending. It has little channels here. 
And what happens is, whenever your blood pressure is high, it's gonna stretch the actual vessel walls. When it stretches the vessel walls, what happens is it activates this channel to bring sodium ions in whenever the blood vessel is being stretched. So whenever the blood vessel is being stretched, it activates these baroreceptors, which opens up these channels on the baroreceptor sensory nerve endings and allows for sodium to flow in. But what did we say was the actual situation? We said that this person had a systolic blood pressure less than 100 millimeters of mercury, maybe even very significant to about 80. Is that gonna be stretching the blood vessel walls? No. If it doesn't stretch the blood vessel walls, is there gonna open up these channels? No. Is sodium gonna flow in? No. So these channels are not gonna be open, they're gonna be closed. What's gonna to happen to the actual potentials, the action potentials carry down this axon? It's going to not occur, or it's gonna be very, very little or very slow. So we can say slow or no APs, okay? Action potentials carried on these nerves. So let's get this clear. Low blood pressure, there's going to be very little stretch on the blood vessel wall. Very little stretch on the blood vessel wall is pretty much, we can say, not going to stimulate this vagus nerve. So we like to say it as though it's really inhibiting the nerve. Okay, it's inhibiting the sensory afferent fibers of the vagus nerve. It's also inhibiting the sensory afferent fibers of the bare receptors that are located within the carotid sinus, carried on the glossopharyngeal nerve. When they take this information up to the nucleus of tractus solitarius, the nucleus of tractus solitarius kind of sifts through that information. As it sifts through that information, it says, oh crap, the blood pressure's low. I have to respond to this correctly. So he says, I got three centers to choose from. What are those centers? This maroon center here, this maroon center here is called the cardiac accelatory center. I'm gonna put that as CA, the cardiac accelatory center. This center is connected with our sympathetic nervous system. So the cardiac accelatory center is connected with your sympathetic nervous system. This brown one here is called the vasomotor center. I'm gonna put a VM, the vasomotor center. And the vasomotor center is also connected with our sympathetic nervous system. And this last one here, this green one, is actually called the cardiac inhibitory center. But really, this is where the dorsal nucleus of vagus is. So that's where the actual nucleus of the vagus nerve is located. So the cardiac inhibitory center is connected with the vagus nerve. And if you guys remember, we said the vagus nerve is primarily a parasympathetic nerve. So we can say that the cardiac inhibitory center is connected with the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so let's get this straight then. If this comes into this nucleus here, what is this blue nucleus here called? Nucleus of tractus solitarius, right? Once this gets uh, sends the, it gets these signals from the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve. It's going to do two things. It's going to send signals to the cardiac accelatory center. It's going to send signals to the cardiac inhibitory center. And it's going to do one more thing, and it's going to send signals to the vasomotor center. If our blood pressure is low, what are we going to want to do? We're going to want to ha have the heart contract more or the heart rate to increase so that we can have more blood coming out. Why? Because you have to remember this formula. I'm going to put smack dab right here in the middle. What do we say? blood pressure is equal to the cardiac output multiplied by the total peripheral resistance. This is so important. This formula is so crucial to understand. So we're gonna have to try to change this up a little bit, okay? So first thing we're gonna do here, if we look at this, we're gonna wanna speed up the heart rate and we're gonna wanna have the heart rate um, increase and we're gonna want the contractility to increase. So we're gonna stimulate the cardiac accelatory center. Because if we do that, we're gonna increase our cardiac output. If we increase heart rate, because what, again, what is heart rate equal to? Remember, cardiac output is equal to heart rate times the stroke volume. So if you increase the heart rate, you increase the cardiac output. If you increase the stroke volume, you increase the cardiac output. You increase the cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure. So first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna stimulate the cardiac accelatory center. But we don't want the cardiac inhibitory center coming into play here, because it's gonna to try to slow the heart rate down. So we want to inhibit this center. So stimulate the cardiac accelatory, inhibit the cardiac inhibitory. But then we gotta do one more thing. We have to stimulate the vasomotor center. Because what the vasomotor center is gonna do is it's gonna activate the sympathetic nervous system to increase your total peripheral resistance. It's gonna constrict the blood vessel. How do I know that? Because you know, there's another formula here. Let's just get rid of the diaphragm. We don't need it anyway. Resistance is equal to 8NL over pi R4. 
And this is Poiseuille's, uh, part of the Poiseuille's equation. He says that as your radius decreases, as the radius decreases, the resistance increases significantly. So we're gonna constrict the vessels, which is gonna decrease the radius, which is going to increase the resistance. And if you increase the resistance, you increase the blood pressure. Okay, so now that we know what centers are being controlled, let's see how they're being affected. So let's come over here to this side for a second so we can see it a little better. So I just had the, I drew another cardio, uh, central nervous system here. And again, real quickly, this one is cardiac accelerator, vasomotor center, cardiac inhibitory, and nucleus of tractus solitarius. All right, we already said the cardiac accelerator center was activated. If the cardiac accelerator center is activated, it'll come down to a specific region in the spinal cord. Okay, this region is right around T1 uh, to anywhere from T1 to L2. Okay, anywhere from T1 to L2. This is the sympathetic outflow. So this is the SNS outflow. Okay, sympathetic nervous system outflow. Particularly, most of the fibers come from, from T1 to T5. But anyway, these cardiac accelerator fibers come down and they act on these preganglionic fibers in the lateral gray horn. These fibers come out and they come to a ganglion, like a sympathetic chain ganglion or a, a cervical ganglion. Either way, they come to these ganglion and then they come out. Where are they gonna go? They're gonna go to two destinations. One destination is it's gonna go to a special structure located within the right atrium and another structure which is located near the actual bifurcation where the actual atria and the ventricles are separated. What are these two areas? One of the areas is gonna to go to what's called the SA node. The other area is it's gonna to go to what's called the AV node. What is it gonna do there? Let's see. What are these chemicals releasing? What are these guys releasing under the SA node and the AV node? Let's look at it right here. Let's say that this is the SA node or the AV node. Okay, let's say that the SA node or AV node. What is it gonna to try to do? Okay. Here is the chemical that it releases. It releases what's called noroepinephrine. Norepinephrine is gonna come over here and bind onto these receptors on the SA node or AV node, okay? Now, when the norepinephrine binds onto these receptors, what kind of receptors are they? You know they're called beta-1 adrenergic receptors? When it binds onto these beta-1 adrenergic receptors, it activates a specific protein. One is it activates a G protein, particularly G stimulatory protein, which gets rid of, you guys should know this by now, GDP and binds GTP, which turns it on. This guy will come and activate a effector enzyme. That effector enzyme is called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is gonna do what? So once it stimulates adenylate cyclase, adenylate cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP. Once it activates cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. And what does protein kinase A do? It comes over to the membrane and it finds these special channels located on the membrane. Look at these channels. Look at these beautiful, beautiful channels here. These beautiful channels are specifically for calcium. And what it does is, this guy comes over here and it puts a phosphate onto this channel. And when it does that, it opens up the channel, it activates the channel. And calcium ions start flowing in very, very, excessively. And what is this going to do? Well, if it flows into the SA node or the AV node, we're going to have more calcium coming in, which is going to ultimately increase the heart rate. Okay? We're going to have more action potential. So more calcium coming in allows for more action potentials. More action potentials means increasing heart rate. If you increase the heart rate, what does that increase? Come over here for a second. We said that whenever you increase the heart rate, you increase the cardiac output. When you increase the cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure. So that's what it's gonna do. So it's gonna try to increase the heart rate, which will do what? Increase the cardiac output. As you increase the cardiac output, you increase the BP. Voila! That's one way that we can fix this whole issue. So one thing that you're gonna notice with someone who is having low blood pressure is that they're gonna try to compensate by increasing the heart rate. So their heart rate might be a little higher, their pulse might be a little higher, right? Okay, that's one thing that we're gonna know. What else can it do, these sympathetic nerves? They can also, let's follow these bad boys here because they can also go to two other destinations. They can come over here and they can come to the myocardium of the heart, the muscle of the heart. Because the SA node and the AV node and the Purkinje fibers and the bundle of Hiss, all that stuff, those guys are primarily nodal cells. They don't contract. These cells here do contract. Let's follow this other fiber over here for a second. 
because it's going to come over here to this myocardium here also. Okay? What is it going to do? How is it going to act on this guy? It's going to act through the same mechanism. So, if we were to just clean this up a little bit here, say that we clean this up a little bit, I'll explain to you what exactly is happening. So what happens, the only thing that's a little bit different in this situation, in this cell, is it activates cyclic AMP, right? And then it will actually activate protein kinase A, okay? Protein kinase A will still come and phosphorylate these channels. So this is the same thing, except now, instead of it acting on the SA node and the AV node, it also can act on the myocardium of the heart, the contractile unit. So this is the contractile unit. When it does this, calcium flows in. As more calcium starts flowing in, what happens? More calcium means more cross bridge formation. If we have more cross bridges, what do I mean by cross bridges? You know, you have these things here like, um, let's say here I have the thin filament, I have actin, and over here on this part I have the thick filament, which is going to be the myosin. So I have thin filament, which is pretty much the consisting of the actin, and over here I'm going to have the myosin. What happens is if I have more calcium coming to this area, it's going to bind onto a protein called troponin, which will change the shape of the tropomyosin, which will open up these active sites for the myosin to bind into actin and trigger the power stroke. Initially, so what's the overall result? If we have more calcium, we're going to have more cross bridges, and then more cross bridges means more a powerful contraction, so an increase in contraction. Now, if you guys know anything about contraction, if you increase contractility, what does that do? It increases stroke volume. If you increase the stroke volume, what does that do? Let's come over here for a second. We said that if you increase the stroke volume, you increase the cardiac output. You increase the cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure, okay? So, so far we've been able to settle two things here. So let's just make it nice and clean here and get the overall effect of all of this so that way we know exactly what is happening again we can say the sympathetic nervous system is acting on the SA node, AV node, and the myocardium of the heart. And again, it's doing it through this protein kinase A, who's coming in phosphorylating these calcium channels. Calcium is flowing in very heavy, and the overall result is to do two things. One is to increase the heart rate, and the other one is to increase the contractility. All right, sweet. And these are both going to try to increase the blood pressure. That's one way that our body's going to deal with that. Okay, what about this vasomotor center? We also said that he was stimulated, right? So we said the nucleus of tractus solutarius stimulated this guy, stimulated this guy, and inhibited this guy. What does the vasomotor center do? It basically does the kind of the same thing as the actual uh, cardiac accelerator center. He comes down here, and he gives off these fibers also. So he gives off some fibers. And they go to the preganglionic uh, neurons located within the thoracolumbar region of the spinal cord. And they come out. Okay? So these guys come out. Now they're going to go to a ganglion, some type of ganglion out here. And what they're going to do is they're going to go to the blood vessels. They're going to go to the blood vessels. So look at this. Let's follow this sucker here. If we follow this guy here, where is he going to go? Oh, yeah, baby. There he goes. Right there. Okay? So what happens? Activate the vasomotor nerve center. The vasomotor nerve center brings these postganglionic sympathetic fibers to the blood vessels. Where in the blood vessels? To be very, very particular, it's particularly located within the tunica media. That's where these fibers are going to terminate. They're going to go to the tunica media, the muscular layer of the actual our arterioles. What it's going to do is it's going to bind onto specific receptors in that area. Okay, so if it wants to contract, it, it'll primarily act through alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. And what chemical is it going to be releasing here? It's going to be releasing noroepinephrine. When it releases noroepinephrine, norepinephrine is going to come in here and it's going to bind onto this receptor. When this norepinephrine binds on, let's make this nicer. Let's make it very, very pretty. We want it to be purry. When norepinephrine binds onto this alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, what happens? He basically works through a special mechanism and this mechanism that he's going to try to exert is he's going to try to stimulate this adrenergic receptor to cause the smooth muscle cell to contract. It's going to try to bring more calcium into the smooth muscle cells. If that happens and this, this actual smooth muscle contracts, what is it going to do to the blood vessel? It's going to try to constrict the blood vessel. So what is this going to result in? It's going to result in vasoconstriction. So now what is it going to do? 
if you vasoconstrict the blood vessel, you're gonna squeeze the blood vessel and that's gonna decrease the diameter. Well, if you decrease the diameter of the blood vessel, what's that gonna do to the radius? What's half of the diameter? The radius. So now I'm gonna decrease the radius of the blood vessel. If I decrease the radius of the blood vessel, what do we say? We said Poiseuille's equation is that whenever you decrease the radius, you increase the resistance by a fourfold. That's significant. So I'm gonna increase my total peripheral resistance. And what do we say? If you increase total peripheral resistance, it increases your blood pressure. So as a result, you're gonna have an increase in the BP. And voila, another way to try to fix the problem, okay? So there's another way that we're trying to fix the problem. So one way that we try to do so far is increase the heart rate, increase the contractility. The other way is to constrict the blood vessel to increase the resistance to try to bring up the BP, okay? That's one way. Okay, now that's that for the heart aspect. But we wanna see everything connected because that's what you wanna understand, how things are connected. So now what we gotta do is, actually we have to see one more thing for the heart. I actually lied, we need one more thing. You know the heart has other sympathetic fibers here too? It has other sympathetic fibers. And these sympathetic fibers are very, very special because what happens is these sympathetic fibers, they actually, they shouldn't terminate here. There should be some special sympathetic fibers that will actually pass right through the sympathetic chain ganglia. And when they pass through the sympathetic chain ganglia, they actually synapse on the cell bodies of the postganglionic motor neurons within the adrenal medulla. And you know what the adrenal medulla consists of? It consists of these chromaffin cells. And these chromaffin cells consist of postganglionic motor neurons. And guess what they release? They release two chemicals. One is epinephrine. So one is they release epi. The other one is they release noroepinephrine. But which one are they releasing in larger amount? They're releasing 80% epinephrine and about 20% of it in norepinephrine. What can epinephrine do? It can do the same thing norepinephrine did. It can come over here and cause vasoconstricting the blood vessel. It can act on the myocardium of the heart and cause increased contractility. It can even act on the SA node and the AV node and increase the heart rate. So it can do all of those things also, okay? So just so that we're aware, this is another mechanism here that we try to utilize to increase the actual uh, systemic response to increase our blood pressure. All right, sweet, that's that part. Let's go on to the next thing then. Okay, so let's see how the actual kidneys are involved in this. Let's see how the kidneys are involved. So here we have a kidney. The kidneys are very, very uh, specific, and the reason why is they have, they have their own autoregulation mechanism because you have to protect your kidneys whenever there are certain types of systemic changes in your blood pressure. But one thing that the kidneys do to protect themselves, let's say that I have low BP, right, again, so low blood pressure. Low systemic blood pressure coming in, and there's gonna be less blood coming from the actual vessels into the kidney, right? Less blood coming into the actual kidney. Now, whenever there is low BP, there are special cells in the kidney that pick up that low BP. These cells are called the JG cells. These JG cells respond to that decrease in BP and they release a chemical called renin. They release a very, very important chemical here called renin. Now what is it about renin that's gonna help us out? Oh, you'll see. So now what we're gonna do is the kidney is gonna release this renin out into the bloodstream. Okay, so renin is gonna release, be released out into the bloodstream. So what happened? Low BP activated these JG cells to cause them to produce renin. You know what else is really crazy? Remember that epinephrine? Epinephrine that was also released, it can come over here and it can act on beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the JG cells of the kidney and also increase the production of renin. So two things are acting to increase the production of renin. One is low BP and the other one is the actual production of epinephrine, which can act on the beta-1 adrenergic receptors and trigger the release of renin. What's renin gonna do? Okay, let's follow renin. Renin comes out into the circulation and as he's coming through the circulation, he runs into another protein, okay? Because renin is kind of like a nice enzyme. The liver produces a really cool protein. This protein that the liver is producing and it's constantly circulating throughout the bloodstream is called angiotensinogen. Tensinogen. What happens is 
renin is going to come and cleave angiotensinogen. So it's, angiotensinogen is kind of an inactive uh, protein. What happens is renin is going to act as an enzyme, and it's going to cut certain amino acids off angiotensinogen. When it cuts certain amino acids off of angiotensinogen, it does something really special. It converts angiotensinogen into another molecule. This molecule is called angiotensin 1. So what is this molecule called again? The molecule that it actually produces is called angiotensin 1. So as a result, when angiotensinogen gets converted into angiotensin 1, look what happens here. Now we have angiotensin 1. Now angiotensin 1 is still not good enough to produce this systemic effect that we're looking for. So what happens? Angiotensin 1, he continues throughout the actual blood pro process, right? So let's say he goes into the actual right atrium. From the right atrium, he gets pumped into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, he gets pumped up into the pulmonary trunk, through the pulmonary arteries, and he gets over here into the pulmonary capillaries in the actual lungs. In the lungs, there's another special enzyme. <clears throat> this enzyme is called angiotensin converting enzyme. We also like to denote it as ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. This enzyme will act on angiotensin 1. So what's going to be present right here at this point in time? Right here we're going to have this still kind of precursor molecule called angiotensin 1. What happens is ACE is going to act on angiotensin 1 and convert angiotensin 1 into a very powerful hormone called angiotensin 2. Okay? And ACE is going to drive this process. So ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, is stimulating angiotensin 1 to go into angiotensin 2. Now, where does angiotensin 2 go? Oh, he's got some destinations. This guy, he does so much. Okay, so let's see all the things that angiotensin 2 is doing. First thing, it's going to come over here to the adrenal cortex. You know in the adrenal cortex we have these cells called zona glomerulosa? So it's called the zona glomerulosa cells. This angiotensin 2 will come over here and he will act on special receptors on the zona glomerulosa. Stimulate the zona glomerulosa cells to release a chemical into the bloodstream. And this is a very, very powerful hormone. This hormone is called aldosterone. So this hormone is called aldosterone. We're going to see what he does in a second because I'm going to combine him with another hormone that angiotensin 2 also stimulates. So look here. Angiotensin 2 has done that so far. He also comes down a little bit more. He's like, hey, you know what? I see someone else that I like. And he comes through the circulation into the actual part of the brain, the central nervous system. You know what this structure is called? This is called the hypothalamus. This right here, this top part here is the hypothalamus. This part down here, from this region to this region, is called the pituitary gland. So it's specifically called the pituitary gland. You know specifically this is the posterior pituitary, and this is the anterior pituitary, okay? T together they make up the entire pituitary gland, or the hypothesis as you can call it, okay? So there is that. What happens is, Angiotensin 2 comes over here and he acts on specific receptors inside of the hypothalamus. You know there's a special nucleus here, this kind of group of nuclei right here? This group of nuclei here is called the supraoptic nucleus. What happens is angiotensin 2 comes over and stimulates the supraoptic nucleus. When the supraoptic nucleus is activated, it sends action potentials down the axons, the tract, the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract. As it does that, it triggers the release of a special chemical called antidiuretic hormone. Also, you can call it vasopressin. So what does it release into the bloodstream then? It also releases ADH into the bloodstream. So now we have two things that it's triggered. One thing is it's triggered the production of ADH. The other thing is it's triggered the production of aldosterone. But guess what? He's like, I'm not done. He's going to do something else. He says, I see some other neurons over here that appeal in, are appealing to me. These neurons control your thirst. So there's other neurons that are located within the hypothalamus that control your thirst. 
angiotensin II comes over and stimulates the hypothalamic thirst centers. And this triggers the release of certain chemicals that are gonna bring about the actual desire for thirst. So if you drink more water, let's say that you become thirsty. So there's an increase in your thirst. What are you gonna do? You're gonna take in more water. If you, or fluids, whatever. You're gonna bring in more water. So increase absorption of fluids across the GIT. If you have more absorption of fluids, then what's gonna happen? Your blood volume is gonna go up. You know blood volume actually increases a specific thing called the end diastolic volume. We talked about that in cardiac output. What happens is in diastolic volume, if that increases, that increases your stroke volume. If you increase stroke volume, you increase cardiac output. And if you increase cardiac output, you increase BP. So that's another way that we're dealing with it. So one way we dealt with it is by increasing thirst and by producing aldosterone and ADH. What in the heck do these guys do? Let's see. Let's follow ADH and aldosterone over here to the kidney. Okay, what I'm doing is, I'm taking a, a, the structural and functional unit out of the kidney. So you see here in the kidney, we have the kidney, I'm taking out a special structure called the nephron. Okay, so I'm looking at what's called the nephron. So I'm looking here specifically, let's actually put it right here, because we're not gonna use too much of this right here. We're looking at a special structure called the nephron. What happens is, ADH and aldosterone are gonna act in two different parts here. ADH is gonna act in what's called the collecting duct. Okay, there's actually what's called V2 receptors. And what happens is ADH, also known as vasopressin, comes over here and acts onto this receptor. When ADH acts onto this receptor, he activates a G-stimulatory protein, which you guys already know the story, activates adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP increases the protein kinase A levels. And if this happens, remember those special proteins? Ooh, let's use the teal. We have those special proteins. Remember we had the vesicles here with those special aquaporins? These guys are special proteins called aquaporin 2. What happens is protein kinase A comes over here and phosphorylates this, uh, these vesicles, which triggers this process of bringing those actual channels towards the membrane. So this vesicle fuses with the membrane, and what it does is it puts these channels into the membrane. So now look, we have another channel here. Let's say that we put three channels in. Okay, so what did protein kinase A do? Protein kinase A phosphorylated these vesicles, which are containing this protein called aquaporin-2. As it did that, so now let's get this aquaporin-2 out the way here. Because we phosphorylated the aquaporin-2. It was actually pre-synthesized in this cell, right? But ADH can also increase the synthesis of him. So what we did is, we have protein kinase A phosphorylate this vesicle here containing all these aquaporin-2 molecules. Now that he did that and he phosphorylated this guy, he stimulated it by phosphorylating it, we put these actual channels into the membrane. As we do that, what's flowing through the actual kidney tubules? What's pretty much most of your urine made up of? It's actually 93% water. So what happens is water flows through these actual aquaporins. What type again? Aquaporin type two. Then what happens is they come out of these aquaporin twos and they move into your circulation. So let's say that I actually draw here a part of your actual circulation. Actually, no, it's right here. Let's just bring it over here. There's your circulation right there. Let's say that this actually moves over here and we bring the water into the circulation. If you increase the volume of water inside of the actual blood, you're increasing the blood plasma. If you increase the blood plasma, you increase the actual what? Blood volume. If you increase the blood volume, you increase the EDV. If you increase the EDV, you increase the stroke volume. Increase the stroke volume, you increase the cardiac output, you increase the cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure. Okay? Holy crap. Now, what is aldosterone doing? Aldosterone is actually coming over here and it's acting on this specific area here called the distal convoluted tubule. And again, the ADH was acting on a specific area called the collecting duct but it can also act on the distal convoluted tubule. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone. So he comes in, let's say that here's the nucleus of the cell. Aldosterone comes in 
and binds onto a special intracellular receptor. So let's say you have an intracellular receptor, okay? Aldosterone will come over here and he'll bind onto this intracellular receptor. When he does that, this receptor, steroid hormone receptor interaction, will come over and activate specific genes. When it activates genes, it'll produce three main proteins. Okay, one protein here, one protein here, and I'll put one protein back here. The main one that it's gonna put out here is going to be a, a, a protein for sodium channels. Okay, so it's gonna put a protein there for sodium channels. It's also gonna put a protein back here in the basal lateral membrane. And it'll produce, put one more protein into the membrane here, which is gonna be for potassium. So what is it gonna do? If it does this, this potassium channel will allow for potassium ions to leak out. This sodium channel right here will allow for sodium ions to come from the filtrate into the cell and then eventually into the blood. And then what happens is we have this pump back here, which is doing, uh, doing what? It's pumping three sodium ions out of the cell and it's pumping two potassium ions into the cell, utilizing ATP, okay? What's the whole purpose of this? We're taking the protons from the blood. If your proton levels are really high, we're getting rid of those protons. We're excreting out the protons, and we're bringing in sodium. If sodium starts actually moving into the blood, so let's say that sodium is moving into the blood. Here's your sodium ions. It's moving into the blood. Who else likes to follow? Water. But remember, what hormone has to be present in order for water to be able to get absorbed here? ADH. So ADH would have to act on V2 receptors. And then V2 receptors would increase the cyclic uh, AMP pathway and increase the expression of aquaporin type 2. And who would follow the sodium? The water. Okay? And then water, if the water is going into the blood, what happens? Again. If you increase the water volume inside of your bloodstream, you increase the blood plasma. If you increase the blood plasma volume, you increase the blood volume. If you increase the blood volume, you increase the EDV, which is the end diastolic volume. If you increase that, you increase the stroke volume. If you increase the stroke volume, you increase cardiac output and then increase blood pressure. Holy crap. Okay, we did that too. One other thing I'm going to mention very, very briefly is that angiotensin II can also act on what's called the proximal convoluted tubule cells. So angiotensin II also has receptors here that he can bind to and trigger an increase in what's called sodium reabsorption, chloride reabsorption, and water reabsorption. If I bring into the bloodstream all three of these chemicals, primarily that of increased water, an increase in sodium, an increase in chloride, what's gonna happen? Increase the blood volume, increase the endostatic volume, increase the stroke volume, increase cardiac output, blood pressure, you get the deal. That's that part. Okay, now another thing. Angiotensin II also has receptors present on the arterioles, just like the epinephrine does. So what else could angiotensin II do? Besides stimulating aldosterone production, besides stimulating ADH, it could also come over here and bind onto these receptors, these angiotensin II receptors, which are located on the tunica media, right, of the arterial. So what is this guy right here gonna be? This is for the tunica media, just like the sympathetic nervous system. When it does that, it actually causes vasoconstriction. If you cause that whole vasoconstrictive process, we already know what it's gonna do. It's gonna increase your blood pressure, okay? How? If you vasoconstrict the blood vessels, you decrease the diameter of the blood vessels, you decrease the radius of the blood vessels. Using Poiseuille's equation, that increases the resistance significantly, which increases the blood pressure. Okay, that's that part. Another thing that actually happens in the kidneys is if you think about it, what did we say was happening to the blood flow going to the kidneys? There was a very low blood flow going to the kidneys. If there's l low blood pressure, right, you're gonna have a very little blood going into the kidneys. That means that you're gonna have what kind of urine output as a result here? You're gonna have a decrease in urine output. So as a result, you're also gonna have decrease urine output. Why is that significant? Because if you have a decreased urine output, what that's gonna to try to do is, it's gonna to try to decrease the amount of volume of, of uh, fluids that are being lost in the urine so that we can maintain the actual volume within the blood to maintain our blood pressure. So we're gonna to wanna to decrease the urine output, okay? And this is because if you have low blood pressure, 
at least what's called a low glomerular filtration rate. We talk about this in the kidneys. And if you have a low glomerular filtration rate, you're going to have a decreased urine output. What do you call that whenever you have a decreased urine output? Oliguria. Okay? Okay, and again, by doing that, you can serve a lot more volume. You don't uh, leak as much volume out in the urine. One other thing that can affect our actual blood pressure is, um, we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but we also have the actual cortex. The cortex also has influence on the actual medullary respiratory centers. The hypothalamus, which is located right here, right? So you know that you have the hypothalamus right here. The hypothalamus also has the ability to control your blood pressure. You also have special nuclei in this area. What are these nuclei here called? special nuclei called limbic nuclei. And these can also influence the actual respiratory centers. So because of that, you have in certain situations like maybe in stress or emotions or anxiety, certain things like that, that can actually influence these centers within the brain. By what way? Maybe increasing the cardiac accelerator center. If you're really, really stressed, if you're really, really anxious, you probably noted that your heart is racing a lot, you're having increased contractility, maybe palpitations. And the reason why is because limbic nuclei, hypothalamus, and even some of the actual cerebral cortex has a little bit of influence on the uh, medullary, cardiovascular, and vasomotor centers. All right, engineers, so in this video, we covered a lot of information about what our body does in certain situations like in hypotension or low blood pressure and how it tries to regulate that. I hope all of it made sense. I truly do. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, in the next video, we're going to talk about what happens, how the, what are the compensation mechanisms whenever our blood pressure is too high. So then we'll get to see exactly what this cell was used for, which is going to be how acetylcholine works on these SA node cells and AV node cells. And we'll see other different effects with the kidneys and other different types of organs. All right, engineers, I hope to see you guys there. And uh, as always, until next time.